Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Developing Questions for Effective Surveys. This webinar is brought to you by Evaluate the Evaluation Resource Center for Advanced Technological Education. Evaluate is supported by a grant from the National Science Foundation. And again, we do want to apologize for starting just a couple minutes late. Thanks for hanging um, on and uh, being patient with us. I'm Kristen Martens, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. And here with me at Western Michigan University is Lori Wingate, Evaluate's principal investigator. Behind the scenes, making sure that everything runs smoothly, we have Tracy Pixler Anderson from Maytech Networks and ATE Resource Center at Maricopa Community College. This webinar is presented through Blackboard, and we're going to take just a moment to orient you to some things you need to know to make the most out of your time today. It is clear by the hands that are starting to be raised that many of you already are familiar with Blackboard functions. But for those of you who are new to our webinar system, this is a screenshot of what you should see on the far left of your screen. So if you'll notice the hand icon, you just click on that and you can raise your hand. Below the icons um, is a uh, sorry, below the hand icon is the participants box. The box lists everyone who is attending this webinar. So you might see colleagues you know, and it's fine to send them notes, but you should know that the moderators do see anything that anyone types into the chat box, which is right here. So the chat box is where you can type questions and comments that you would like the presenters to address. And you can do this at any time, and we really encourage you to do so. To ensure that everyone can follow the conversation, be sure that the Room tab is selected. The tab is located below the chat box to the far left. So let's practice using the chat box now. Please type the name of the organization that you are from and how many people are viewing this webinar in your room with you. So if you are alone, you would type 1. And if you're with two colleagues beside yourself, go ahead and type 3. Okay. Um, we'll take a few question and answer breaks throughout the webinar, and we'll be keeping track of the chat box submissions so that we can address them at those breaks. You can also choose to send a note to the moderators, which will not be seen by any other participants, and you can do that by collecting, or clicking the moderator button. As I mentioned before, you can send private messages to other participants, and the moderators will see those comments, but feel free to do so. First, you would select the person's name, and then their name will appear as a tab below the chat box down at the bottom. And you would click on that and send them a message. If you have any technical issues and questions, you can send a private message to Networks Admin using the same process. Just click on the Networks Admin button in the middle and then choose the tab below. The last tool I want to show you is the marker tool, which we are actually going to use later in the webinar. So to use the marker tool, first you click on the marker icon, which appears just to the right of the participants box, then select your color. So let's try that now. If you could take a look at the map and indicate your location using the marker tool. If you're joining us from outside the US, you can make your mark off the coast in the direction of your location. And it appears right away we've got some people in Michigan, Texas. We're kind of on the north and the south end at this point. <laughs> Someone's traveling. All right. And Lori will also bring us through a tutorial. If you're having any troubles with finding that marker tool, um, she'll help you again when we actually use it. So to progress on, we have um, materials that will be available following this recorded webinar. We will be emailing you a link to the recording next week along with the accompanying handout and slides of this presentation. All of the materials will also be available on our website, although we do need a few days to upload them. So please be patient with that piece. 
By the end, by participating in the webinar today, you will be able to identify how survey questions fit into and inform broader evaluation purposes. You will be able to apply guidelines for question construction to develop sound survey items. And you will be able to develop survey items that align with analysis needs and or constraints. So let's now turn it over to Lori. Thank you very much, Kristen. And I just want to make sure, um, as I saw people using the chat box, that you do have the far left tab at the bottom left of your screen um, highlighted. So it should say room if you're sharing comments and questions. It seemed like some of those were going mainly to the moderators. We got a little bit of uh, growing pains here. We're trying a new audio system and Blackboard. This is only our second webinar with that Blackboard. So we're still kind of learning the ropes here. Um, we wanted to start out um, the meat of this webinar with a, with a pretty high level view of the role of surveys and evaluation, especially the evaluation of ATE projects and centers. And again, for those of you who may not be familiar with the ATE program, we do get quite a few people outside of the program, ATE stands for Advanced Technological Education. It's a National Science Foundation program focused on improving technician education. Uh, most of the funding goes to community colleges, but there are um, there's some work being done at other educational levels, including K-12 and post-baccalaureate. So when we say ATE, that's what we're referring to. And when we say STEM, you'll hear that, you may hear that a lot. That stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. So to get a better sense of what surveys are being used for in ATE evaluation and STEM education more broadly, I went through several documents that I, that I have on hand, as well as a lot of things I found on the web. And here's a array of the types of data collected via survey that I saw in the various materials that I reviewed. It's certainly, certainly not an exhaustive list, but some examples are, um, for example, let's see if I get the right marker thing there, um, feedback from participants at outreach events, um, self-assessments by faculty and students of knowledge and skills, feedback from workshop participants, um, what else? Stakeholder perceptions about an overall project and its, and its resources. So these, this is real world stuff. So I find it useful when I think about how does data fit into an overall evaluation. It helps me if I think about it, a project in a logic model structure. And um, in case there's some, some folks on here who aren't familiar with logic models, sorry about that. I'm just going to give you a, a crash course in logic models. So this is the basic structure. It's a, a logic model, basically a visual depiction of what a project does and what it's ex expected to accomplish. And this just shows the basic structure. But in a complete logic model, you, there would be boxes under each of these columns that show the various components and expected outcomes of a project. Um, there's lots of different ways to do logic models. This structure is fairly common. It's the one I tend to use, but it's by no means the only or the best um, way to do that. But at, at this level, at activities, um, these are simply what a project is, is doing with its grant money. The outputs are the tangible, observable, countable products, uh, no, pe number of people reached and sort of thing. So at these levels, an evaluation typically is assessing the project's reach, its productivity, people's satisfaction with it, and things like that. Short-term outcomes are typically changes in participants' knowledge, skills, attitudes, and at the level of midterm outcomes, this is basically what we expect to happen as a result of those changes in individual skills, knowledge, and behavior, and so forth, or attitudes. Um, for example, if you learn something because of this webinar, what might you do differently in practice? And at the level of long-term outcomes, we're looking for changes in broader conditions. In ATE, it's largely about um, impact on technician education, although the project outcomes would be articulated more specifically than that. So that's a crash course in logic models and how evaluation um, kind of lines up with the different levels. So we're going to take a closer look at a few of the examples that I showed you before um, in terms of the kinds of data that's collected for ATE evaluations. We're going to look at these in particular. And we're going to do a little exercise. We're going to um, use another, another function of uh, a Blackboard, which I'll show you how to do in a moment. But we're going to, I'm going to 
present these, and then I'm going to ask you to indicate at what level of, of a project design or logic model these would line up with. So we're going to use a, a new function here, um, the pull buttons. So you will find your pull buttons um, right under your name. It's going to be the button on the, on the far right that appears under your name. You should see A, B, C, D, and E if you hover over that little A there. So I think Tracy probably has brought those up for us. So if a survey is used to, in, to gather data from participants at an outreach event, where does that fit into this structure? If you think it would provide data for the evaluation of activities or outputs, um, you would select A using your pull buttons. If you think it would be informative about um, changes in knowledge, skills, attitudes, you would select B. If you think it's more about changes in practices or behaviors, select C, and so on. You'd select D if you think this is about changes in broader conditions. And we don't have an E option on the screen, but we do have an E option on the pull button. So you, if, if you don't like any of these options, if you don't think it fits anywhere, you can select E. So we'll give you just a second to register your response there. Looks like quite a few people have answered. So Tracy, could you go ahead and show the results? Very good. Most people selected A, and that is the best answer. Um, immediate reaction from an event is, is not an indicator of long-term outcomes um, or even really anything else other than satisfaction and reaction. Okay, we're going to do a few more of these, and I think they'll probably go a little faster as you get the hang of the pull buttons. So the next one is faculty reports of the, their use of professional development content. So you go to some sort of professional activity, you learn something, and then this is data about whether you used it or not. So again, just select, select A, B, C, or D to indicate which level you think this goes with. And if you don't like any of those options, you can select E for none. Okay, we've got a lot of few people who've answered, so could we see the results? Excellent, you guys have got this. So C is the best answer. Um, this is, would be used to measure changes in, in practice of behavior. Of course, it would be a good idea to get data from other sources that aren't self-reported. So we'll go on to the next one. If we're gathering data about um, the employment outcomes for our graduates, at what level would this be addressing? Again, feel free to choose E if you don't like any of the options. Okay, great. A lot of people have answered, so we'll go ahead and see the results. Perfect. Um, yes, of course, this is really what we're looking for, uh, sort of long-term employment um, outcomes and advances in our, in our economy and uh, our, our, our workforce. So good. I have one more. Oh, no, I have two more. This is the second to last one. Students' intent to pursue STEM, educa STEM education uh, or career. Where would this fall in this continuum? Okay, Tracy, go ahead and post the results. Very good, B. This is really a, change, a shift in attitude, which is not the same as behavior. Okay, now the next one really is our last one. Parents' expectations about a K-12 student's participation in a program. Select A, B, C, or D to indicate where this might align in the logic model, and E if you don't think it fits at all. Okay, let's see the results. Okay, we had a lot of people refraining from answering that one, and I, I, I can understand why. It's, it wasn't clear to me where this might fit into to an evaluation. Um, it may, be, have, may have actually been a, re, a research question, it may have been gathering data to get input on a project's design, but in terms of at least how I've laid out uh, these, these sorts of levels of the kinds of information we'd want to get for an evaluation, there isn't a good fit. And so the people who selected at the lower levels that um, that was probably the best choice that you had, given those, or, or E, none of the above. OK, thanks for doing that. That was fun. OK, the point here is just to make sure the findings from um, your survey questions 
data you collect from a survey is going to help answer your evaluation questions. Now, here we want to make sure that people really do understand the difference between evaluation questions and survey questions. I find a lot of times people uh, assume these are the same things and, and use them interchangeably, but they really aren't the same thing. Evaluation questions um, are typically about things like a project's reach, its quality, its effectiveness, its impact, and so forth. And it typically requires multiple data sources and methods to answer these kinds of questions. An example of an evaluation question would be, to what extent has a project increased interdisciplinary collaboration among faculty? Assuming that that would be the purpose of a project that we we're looking at. Survey questions, on the other hand, are simply items on a questionnaire. An example is, how satisfied are you with this webinar? So evaluation questions are much bigger in scope than survey questions. So sort of zooming out to the big picture here, we have a project design with our activities and our intended outcomes, and all ATE projects have this. It may not be in, laid out in a logic model, but there's some rationale and some intended outcome to what's being done. Then you have evaluation questions, which should closely align with the project's purpose and activities and outcomes. And, and again, they may not be actually articulated as questions. And the, the questions may not line up perfectly with those levels. But there's going to be some you know, purpose to the evaluation, whether it's implicit or explicit, phrased as questions, phrased as objectives, or whatever. Then you need to know what indicators you're going to use as data for the evaluation. These might come from a variety of data sources. Um, but this is basically, what are you going to measure and observe to be able to answer those questions? Then you're going to analyze, interpret, and synthesize those results to answer your evaluation question. That's the overall logic. That's the, over, that's the big picture. So of course, today, we're zoning in on the use of surveys. Actually, not just the use of surveys writing questions for, for using surveys and evaluation. So surveys are mainly useful for collecting data on demographics, attitudes, and behaviors. Um, there's a lot of nuances in those categories, but those are, those are the main things. And to get good data from surveys, you need, a lot goes into it, but you know the most basic elements are a good sampling frame to identify your respondents. You need well-chosen and well-crafted survey items and you need good representation of your, the population of interest and good response rates. Of course, this is an oversimplification, but I want to emphasize here there is more to surveys than just writing good questions. But that is the focus of today's webinar, actually writing those questions. So to make sure there's good alignment, you want to make sure there's good alignment between the data you collect via survey and the overall project and its evaluation. So to make sure you're getting there, you want to do a cross-check of your sur survey items with the purpose of an evaluation. So you can look at each item you have on a survey or you're considering for a survey and ask yourself, you know, will the results of this survey item help us identify ways to improve? Will it help us de determine the project's quality and impact? Will it help us account for use of our grant money? If you can't say yes to any of these questions, then there's a good chance you should probably drop the item from your survey. I want to consider just one example here. So let's say we have a project and it has the objective of increasing participation in whatever field we're working in um, among women and underrepresented minorities. And of course, this is a, a high priority for NSF, so a lot of, a lot of ATE grantees are interested in, in measuring this. So we know, of course, it's going to be important to gather data from our participants on gender and race. How else are we going to know? Um, but it's easy when you sit down with a group of people, or even by yourself, and you're thinking about putting items on a survey, it's really easy for this just to sort of snowball. Um, Arlen Gullickson, uh, the PI who started all, all of our work with ATE, um, said every time he went to meet at NSF to talk about our annual survey of ATE grantees with the hope of reducing the length of the survey, they always came away lengthening the, the, the survey. So it's just it's sort of human nature to want to know more. Um, so I'm sort of imagining this group of people, and they're like, well, we, we definitely need to know about gender um, and race and ethnicity. And then somebody's saying, well, we should also ask age, because 
we know that it's of interest to this program that we reach non-traditional students. And then maybe somebody else saying, yeah, let's also ask about income, because I, I want to be able to measure our, impact, our project's impact on their income. And somebody else might have an interest in see to what extent they're reaching um, first generation students. So it would be important to ask about parents' education level. And maybe somebody else who's been at this a long time wants to know if uh, the participants and the students in this program have had um, prior exposure. If there's, for example, if they were doing K-12 programming, did any of those students come in with exposure to, that, to those parts of the intervention? So this can really kind of go on and on. And they all, it, people can make a great case for why this, these kinds of data should collect it. And you know, it just grows. So it's the time to really step back and ask those questions. Will the answers to these items help us improve? Will they help us determine quality and impact? Is it accountability that we're getting at? Um, you have to keep in mind, well, for me, my most precious resource is time. I um, don't have a lot of it these days. And so when you're asking people to complete a survey and take time to answer all these questions, um, it's the more, one of their most valuable resources that they're giving up. So if you don't have a strong rationale for asking these kinds of questions, just don't do it. Um, you know, step back and, and scrutinize it and make, make good decisions. So it may be that you just decide, you know, we don't really need to know these things. We're going to take it out. So there should be strong linkages between the project's activities and outcomes and the evaluation questions or purposes. And again, there should be clear alignment between the data to be collected and what's needed to answer the evaluation question. Bringing this perspective um, to survey development is going to enhance the utility of your evaluation. Um, and this is a huge issue um, in evaluation in any context. And then if you want to know more about ways to enhance utility in evaluation, I strongly urge you to read the work of Michael Patton, who has dedicated his career to helping people uh, do evaluation that's, that's more useful. So this is his latest book on this, Essentials of Utiliz Utilization Focused Evaluation. Um, it's easy to find on the web. We'll have it on our handout. And he, um, he is featured on the first page of our newsletter, which is just got from the printers yesterday and is on our website. Um, so again, if you want to know more about enhancing use, I urge you to read his book. Or just Google him on the web. There's lots of material. So I'm going to turn it over to Kristen now for some Great, questions. Great, Lori. Thanks. Um, we have a question from Laura. And she's asking, wouldn't survey questions be used to answer some evaluation questions? Yes, that is the whole point. And I am sorry if that did not come through, obviously. But yes, we want to have questions on our survey instrument that are going to help us answer our evaluation questions. But we don't we aren't going to put those big questions. I mean, we could. We could put those big questions on a survey, that, but that, like, did this project increase collaboration? You could get those perceptions. But that's, you would have to augment that with several other sources of data. So yes, we want to use our, our survey questions to help inform our evaluation questions. But they are different kinds of questions. They're different levels of questions. Great. And she did type that question in fairly early in the um, first section of the presentation. So. Um, Robin is wondering, what if we are using a survey that many others are using and we want to add it to our data or add our data to pool? Well, that's an interesting idea. So yeah, and I think that's wow, I think that there's a lot of potential for that. I'd like to see more of that, like people using deciding to use the same kind of data collection instrument across sites and then being able to compare data. If you can pull that off, I think it's a wonderful idea. Great. And Lori, I'm wondering if we can go back to um, Laura's question. What if your evaluation isn't organized around evaluation questions? Yeah, and I don't mean to assume that all. I, I don't at all assume that everyone has, has articulated um, what I'm calling evaluation questions. Sometimes they're implicit. Like, you know, it's, you're, getting, you're gathering data to get at impact, to, to learn about effectiveness, to find out about reach. Um, even if you haven't articulated those as questions, there's an there's an explicit or implicit purpose to your evaluation. So you know, if, it's, if it's not obvious what the purpose of evaluation is, that's time to have a conversation about it and bring it more out into the clear. Um, if, you ha if you're at the front end of your evaluation and you have the luxury of sort of articulating and setting forth in the, frame, in the form of questions or objectives, um, then go ahead and do that. But even if those aren't present, there's, you can still go through this process where you're saying, how does this support our overall evaluation? 
Okay. And what about just being exploratory with your evaluation data collection? Yeah, I think that's fine. But again, you need to have a rationale. Like sometimes people will be more exploratory um, early on so they can ask more focused questions later on. And I think that's OK, as long as you can clearly articulate a rationale. I mean, if you don't have anything more than, well, it would be nice to know this. I just want to know. Then, then that's probably not a good reason to have a question on there. OK, good. And I just want to encourage everyone, if you have questions, thoughts, um, please feel free to put them in the chat box. I'll collect them and organize them to ask Lori at the next break. Um, and at this point, we're going to go ahead and move forward and turn it back over to Lori. Thanks, Kristen. So sure. once you've defined um, what data you want, need to gather from a survey and how that information is going to support your overall evaluation, then you have the task of crafting the items that are going to go into your survey instrument. Unless, of course, you're using an, ex uh, an existing instrument. Um, but that's not why you're here with us today. You're here with us today to learn about developing questions. So Don Dillman um, is the guru of survey methodology and social research. Um, we have the citation for his book on our handout, which I know you don't have yet. But if you just Google Don Dillman, this is what's going to come up. He's famous for this, is, this book. He's been working on this forever. Um, and everything you ever wanted to know about developing and running surveys is in this book. It's called Internet, Mail, and Mixed Mode Surveys, the Tailored Design Method. And in this web webinar, and especially in this middle part of the webinar, we're really focusing on the survey items, not the overall survey process. There are tons of great tips on how to write good survey questions. Um, available on the web. Just Google something like guidelines for survey questions, and um, you'll get lots of returns. And the ones that I've gone through that, that come up high on the list, they're, they have great advice. They're very credible. I mean, I would definitely go out there and see what, see what there is. So writing good survey questions is largely about communication. And I want to thank um, Emma, my colleague Emma, who's on the webinar today for doing this little drawing for me when I told her what I wanted. Um, it's largely about communication. And I can't emphasize the, enough the importance of making sure your survey items are going to be understandable and answerable by survey respondents. It's going to improve the quality of your data immensely and the usefulness of your findings and make it a pleasant, more pleasant experience for your respondents. So. You know, just thinking about your daily communications here, or one-on-one, -on -one, in-person communications, just think how often you have misunderstandings. But you're able to clarify them quickly. No, 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 that's not what I meant. I meant this. Um, but those, those misunderstandings are exacerbated in written communication. Now, if your written communication is just going to you know, an email you're sending to one person or, re or a report you're delivering to a small group of stakeholders, they still have the option to Go back to you and ask for clarification and ask for more information. But when you have a survey, you're basically asking questions of lots of people, whether it's 30 people or 1,000 people, in writing. And there's no dialogue about it whatsoever. You really have to get it right the first time. There's not many people who's going to take the time to call you up and say, hey, really wasn't quite sure you were asking here. How should I respond? Um, it doesn't happen very often. So you have one chance to get it right. Um, so we're going to give you all the tips we can in this short period of time to do that and hope you will go out on your own to learn more. So a resource I really like that was developed um, for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention was actually for writing telephone interview questions. It's called the Question Appraisal System, or QAS99 for short, uh, 99 because it was written in 1999. And I really like it because it emphasizes problems to look for. It actually goes through eight steps for identifying problems with survey questions. Today we're going to focus on four of these. I'm going to focus on, um, and this is their label for these categories, um, assumptions, clarity, sensitivity and bias, and response categories. And there's a link, again, we'll have a link for this on our handout that we'll get to you just within a few days. They have a, a very, sort of a, a long version as well as a checklist version of this. So we're going to look at assumptions first. This is a favorite of mine because this, you, I just see issues with this in, in a lot of different surveys I've seen. And here the QAS99 says we need to determine whether there are problems with assumptions made or with the underlying logic. 
and I see often um, assumptions made here with regard to attitudes and experiences. And when you make these kinds of assumptions, uh, it can really wreak havoc on your survey, um, especially when they're with regard to respondents' attitudes and experiences. And I want to focus on attitudes, because this is where I see a lot of problems. I think the experience one is easier for a person to identify as they're developing questions. So let's say there was a workshop on a college campus for faculty and staff on getting external grants. And there's a short survey to get participants' feedback on the events. And the question asks, did the workshop meet your expectations in terms of learning about new funding opportunities? So the first assumption here is that the respondent actually had formulated any expectations about the workshop in advance and that they were conscious of them. Sometimes we're unconscious of our expectations. Um, and the assumption is that not only did they have expectations, but they had them about new funding opportunities. But the respondents may be in a completely different space. This person is here just because her boss told her to come. She may not even have been very sure what it was about before she came to the workshop. This person is working on an ATE pro proposal and just was hoping to get some tips on how to get ATE funding. She isn't even interested in learning about new funding opportunities. And this guy just started a new job in the college's Office of Sponsored Programs. He's new to grants and just wants to learn everything he can, which isn't quite the same thing as having an expectation about learning about new funding opportunities. So these folks may have selected no, or maybe just somewhat to this question. Um, the conference organizers might interpret that as, as a negative opinion of the workshop, but that would be a false assumption um, because of the way they wrote the question. Here's another example. Did this course influence your decision to pursue a career in technology? And I've seen a fair number of questions like this. Um, just like the previous example where it was assumed the respondents had expectations about something, here the assumption is that the person has made some sort of conscious choice about whether or not to pursue a career in technology. Again, that may not reflect reality. This person is just filling a gen ed requirement. She's in a nursing program. She was going to go into technology, but she hates the class so much she's switching to business. Oops. Sorry. There we go. And the last person here um, has been set on a career path in technology since she was in middle school. So her decision was made well before she took the course. Again, we're seeing it's quite possible that our respondents have a very different frame of reference than what we expected or assumed. The question is highly problematic, but I think we can all appreciate what the evaluator was trying to find out here. It's important to determine if and how a, course, a particular course, especially if it was funded through grant money, um, is influencing students' career choices. But we have to ask the question in a different way. So in doing the research for this webinar, I actually came across a very, very similar question in somebody's master's thesis that was examining educational outcomes for a robotics program. There's actually a lot of robotic stuff going on in ATE. So the author got around these problems we identified in this question by asking it this way. I'll just give you a second to glance at the structure of that question. So you can see it removes the assumptions, and it's more of a comprehensive list of options. But you can see the trade-off is wordiness. There's a lot of, it takes a lot of words to provide all these options. But again, just to be aware um, and to make your decisions with intention. So I mean, the bottom line here is don't assume your respondents think like you do or even that they care about what you care about. Now you may be thinking, of course, we're not doing that when we create a survey. We do a survey because we want to know what our respondents think. But it's easy to get so entrenched in your own um, thinking and your own perspective on the world that you're not even aware that you're making these kinds of unwarranted assumptions. Okay, we're going to move on to another topic, um, clarity. And the 
question appraisal system that I mentioned before, their guidelines state that we should identify problems related to communicating the intent or meaning of the question to respondents. And this is very closely related to assumptions because if we're making assumptions about respondents' understanding of certain terms or concepts, it can lead to real problems with clarity, both in terms of what the respondent understands being asked and being able to interpret the results that you get back. So for enhancing clarity, we want to be as precise as possible. Uh, we want to ask about one thing at a time. And we want to avoid being wordy. So here's an example. Do you own or have access to a tablet computer, yes or no? So the purpose of this question is unclear. Is it to learn about ownership? Is it to learn about access? Do we really not care what the difference is there? Or is the intent of the question actually to find out about um, how much we use this device? Or are we trying to find out the likelihood of using an app to support learning or teaching? So it's not likely, uh, this question just has a lot of, it lacks clarity. Um, and as a result, the findings will lack clarity. In short, the, pre the lack of precision diminishes the usefulness of the results. Here's another example. Um, who does most of the student advising for your program? And there's lots of options here. Faculty, staff, advisors in a campus-wide office, advisors in a department office, or no advising. And because it only asks about advising in general, um, it might be unclear to the respondent if we're asking about admission advising, career advising, program advising, even financial advising. And, um, or they may not even stop to wonder which thing you're asking about. They just may have a certain connotation of advising and then answer. And again, this is going to produce results that are hard to make sense out of. So the point here is just to be as precise as possible with our language and, our, and their meaning. OK, I want to get a double barrel question. This is asking about more than one thing at a time, um, which happens a lot, actually more than you would think. So at a glance, this question, um, it looks like it's just two questions, but there's actually four things. Activities, materials, instructor's knowledge, and instructor's preparedness. So the person that wrote these questions assumed that these things, like activities and materials, were so closely related that they actually represented a single construct, and they only required one question and one response or that they're so dependent on each other that the person's opinion about one thing would necessarily apply to the other thing. This is as much as a problem of clarity as it is about false assumptions. And this kind of thing can really frustrate respondents, especially if they have divergent opinions about the things being lumped together. Um, and that has serious ramifications for your response rates and your completion rates. If a person gets annoyed with the way you've written questions and they aren't able to really express their opinions appropriately, they will likely just quit doing the survey. And it wreaks havoc on your data. What does it mean when somebody gives them activities and materials rating, um, gives a fair rating for those? Were they both fair? Were the activities excellent and the materials poor? Was the respondent really addressing, what were they really addressing when they answered this question? We just really don't know. So hopefully you'll discover this kind of problem as you're going through the survey development process. And if you decide you have a problem here, but that you really do need to ask about all four things, you can ask four separate questions like this. So even though all the guidelines you're going to find about writing survey questions say to avoid asking these kinds of double barrel questions, it still happens a lot. Most people writing these questions, I think, are aware of the rule, um, but they really don't realize they're asking about different things. It's not like they're asking about, comp you know, completely different things like uh, pizza and um, your favorite movie, or I mean, your like pizza and historical fiction, or things that just don't go together. So in the in the questioner's mind, these things are very closely related, and it seems OK to ask about them. But not everybody thinks the same. Um, on the next slide, there's some terms I've seen lumped together in real survey questions. So let's look at those. These are all um, from real world surveys. I didn't make this stuff up. 
this is a really common one. And usually it actually includes engineering for STEM. And it might be okay, actually, depending on an audience. For those of us with NSF funding um, and concern with STEM education in general, this might not be a problem at all. But if you're dealing with the general public or, or students, it can be problematic. I think of my, my son who's in fourth grade who loves um, technology and science but is not such a fan of math. So, you know, he, he would have trouble answering this question and whatever his response was would be would not would not probably make wouldn't be an accurate reflection of his opinion, let's put it this way. And you may think that's simple, that's silly to talk about a fourth grader answering this kind of survey, but I have seen surveys of students that deal, you know, have these kinds of terminologies and lumping things together. Ability and confidence I've seen put together, and I think these images do a great job of conveying the different meanings of ability and, co and confidence. I'm sure you all know people with low ability or high and, and high confidence, or vice versa. And again, there's a logical fallacy on the part of the survey developer that these terms describe a single constru construct. It impairs clarity, in short. So pay and job conditions. No explanation needed here. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. These are very different things. Respondents could have very different opinions on each thing. And when they give their response, we are going to have no way of knowing what they had in mind when they answered. So I actually have several more of these, but we're going to do a little interactivity. So on this slide, I divided the terms that appear together in various survey questions, and I mixed them up in each column. So in a moment, I'm going to have you use that marker tool, which we showed you before, but I'll show you it again on the next slide, to match which ones you think go together. And I'm going to demonstrate here. So I'm going to get my marker, and let's see. One of the pairs was actually interesting and exciting. That was together in a survey item. Now, again, these are not my ideas of how they should go together. This is what I gleaned from actual surveys. For me, interesting and, oh, please don't mark it. We're going to do it on the next slide. Um, inter oh, interesting and exciting was a funny example for me because I was thinking of some the most safest place are the least, wait, interesting, exciting. Oh, no. OK, yes. That did go together, but it doesn't fit my example. OK, I just want to give everybody a chance to remember how to do the, the marker before we actually do it. So again, the marker tool will be to the uh, just the right side of the bar um, where the participant list is. And you can pick that pencil and pick a color. And I will go to the next screen where you will now do the little exercise where you will show her how you think these might have appeared together in survey items. That's beautiful. I want to print that and hang it in my office. <laughs> OK, people are having fun now. OK, so there are a lot of ways these could have been paired up. And some of them were more obvious than others. This is how they really showed up in the surveys that I looked at. And this is where I wanted to talk about not interesting and exciting, but actually safe and friendly. Yes, that's the one I was thinking of. I was thinking of airport security, which is maybe one of the safest places you can be but not the most friendly. So in the, re in the researchers' minds, whoever was developing these questionnaires, um, they didn't mean to be asking about different things. They really thought these things were so closely related it only merited one question and one answer. So the bottom line message here is don't ask about more than one thing at a time. Okay, I want to talk about wordiness here. Um, this can really affect the quality of a survey as well. Here's three questions from a 15-item survey. And I'm not showing you all of the questions or even all of the, the wording in, in, the, in the second two items. Because what, what I want to illustrate is that these words, I found that, I found that, I found that, um, don't add anything to the question. They're completely unnecessary. So my recommendation is simply to get rid of them. And when you do that, 
if you get rid of three words for each of the 15 items, you've cut your survey links by 45 words, and the sur survey is shorter, and everybody is happier. And in case you missed the message there, just don't be wordy. Use as few words as possible to convey your message. Okay, this next issue is sensitivity and bias. And the, the QAS guidance groups these issues together. Here we're talking about assessing questions to determine if we're asking about sensitive things and if, if the questions might bias the respondents to answer in a particular way. Now, sensitivity concerns ha um, asking things that are very personal and private and they, people might be uncomfortable sharing. Um, this isn't a huge concern in the ATE context. We're mostly asking about you know, school and work, um, not so much really personal lifestyle or health matters or finances even. Um, but bias has to do with how a question, um, how a question is worded and how comfortable a person is answering it truthfully. And we're going to focus on issues of bias in this section. So key things to minimize here are to avoid asking leading questions and to be aware that anonymity and sample size can affect how people respond, even if questions are well crafted. You know, if you come out of a lecture and you turn to your colleague and say, wow, that was a great lecture, wasn't it? Um, that's not really a genuine inquiry about your colleague's opinion of the lecture. You're expressing your opinion and maybe even seeking affirmation of it. Here's another example of a leading question. Do you believe math and science education is important for preparing our children to participate in a global economy? This is a loaded question. I mean, who would actually say no to this? Um, it's clear that the expectation is that the respondent is going to agree with the statement. Um, and if the researcher had any doubt about it, that maybe they should add an a, a, a image to support uh, the purpose of the question. OK, so that's a little obvious, but the point is, to carefully scrutinize your questions to make sure they're not leading in any way. So the other issue I mentioned were anonymity and sample size, which isn't actually about the questions themselves. For example, here's a question or an item. Please rate the quality of this workshop. That seems pretty straightforward. What could be wrong with that? Um, it's not leading the respondent to a particular response. Seems fine. But what if there are only a few, very few people in the workshop? Um, even if the survey is anonymous, technically, uh, nobody's putting their name on the survey, it may not in actuality be because it's easy to figure out who said what. For example, we have a staff of 10 or 12 here at the Evaluation Center, and a colleague once talked about having an anonymous survey about work, you know, the work climate, and I just, there's no such thing as an anonymous survey in a group like that where you know, you know people so well. So it can really affect how candid people are in their responses, and if the respondents color their responses, the data aren't valid and the whole thing is a waste of time. So the message is, don't ask leading questions. And be aware of how lack of sample size, I mean, how a small sample size and a lack of anonymity could affect responses. So the last issue I want to address is response categories. And here we're not just concerned about phrasing the question part of an item, but the response categories are equally important, so we need to pay careful attention to them as well. Response options should be aligned with a question prompt, they should be non-overlapping, and they should be exhaustive. This is the kind of stuff you're going to find when you Google survey guidelines, but I'm hoping I can sort of bring, a, bring some extra perspective to these issues. So in this example, respondents are asked to react to the statement, the workshop increased my knowledge of evaluation, and they're expected to respond with a rating of poor, fair, good, or excellent. So the response options are really about quality, and the question stem is about increasing knowledge. So there's, there's a mismatch there. If you want to keep the question the same, then the response categories have to be modified so they make sense with the question. One example could be like this. I actually use this a lot because it works with, you can put anything in the statement and the person can react to it with agreement or disagreement. However, I'll admit this is an ideal. Um, a workshop may have increased my knowledge just a little, but I can strongly agree that it increased my knowledge by just a little. So, I mean, I think when people, I know when I've done questions like this, there's sort of been an implicit 
idea here that if I strongly agree there was a bigger increase in, in knowledge. But that again, that's, that's not actually necessarily true. And there's a lack of clarity there. Do we want to know about the presence of something or its magnitude? And this is, was actually putting this together was quite eye-opening to me because I re recently had a very long discussion with a colleague in which I vehemently defended the use of the agreement scale for uh, questions like this. And she vehemently disagreed with me. Um, and it really wasn't until I was doing this slide that I realized, you know, she's right. That I'm, this is, this is not a good way to do this. And so I, I'm going to have to change the way we do our, our surveys. This is probably a better way. Here the rating is clearly an indication of how much the knowledge was increased, not just whether there was the presence of an increase. So you really want to make sure your response options align with question phrasing. And you know, I'm, this is not, uh, this is something I'm still learning. I swear I've been doing things a certain way for years and now it just dawned on me that I didn't like, that that agreement scale may not be the best way to do it. Okay, we're going to shift gears just a little bit. I'm gonna, you need to wake up if you're dozing. Okay, I've been at Western Michigan University for 15 years, so I want to know if anyone else has been at their institution or organization, whatever their workplace is, for 15 years. If you've been there at your workplace for 15 years, just raise your hand. Your hand is right under your name there. Okay, we've got a few people. Okay, has anybody been at their workplace for 10 years? Raise your hand if you've been at your workplace for 10. Okay, what about five? Okay, anyone, has anyone been at their workplace less than a year? Okay, so we have more than 30 people who fit into one of those categories. So this relates to a common problem of having response categories that overlap, like in this question. So if you are one of the 34 people who raised your hand, you would not, you, how to respond to this question would not, not be terribly clear. Um, because if you have been at your workplace like I have for 15 years, you could answer here or here. So you basically have what we call overlapping categories, or you can also call them non-mutually exclusive categories. So we need to fix this. And it's pretty easy. You just have to realize that you made a mistake and the fix is easy. So here's a question of great interest to us at Evaluate, since we exist to serve the people in the ATE program. Here we want to know about the roles people have in the ATE program. Even though there are a lot of options here, we probably haven't covered the gamut of the possibilities. Um, so this is getting at the idea of having exhaustive options. Um, so, but it's, it's easy to fix this. We just add an other category. This is an easy fix to make sure options are exhaustive. But there's another big problem here. Um, it's that the problems are, I mean, that the options are still overlapping or not mutually exclusive. I know there's plenty of cases in ATE where a PI is also a co-PI and possibly also an evaluator and an advisor. So a person could easily check four boxes here. It's not, it's not unusual at all. Basically, being in one category doesn't preclude you from being in another one. But again, this is terribly hard to fix. We can just say, check all that apply. So we, again, easy fix of, ta of for taking care of the overlapping problem. So here's the fixed question, but I still don't love this question. There's still issues with this. So take a moment to look at it, and if you see problems with it, or anything's bugging you about it, I want you to type them in the chat box, because at the um, beginning of the next segment of the webinar, we're going to come back to this question when we talk about analysis. Okay, I'm going to move on. Oh yeah, see any other problems? So if you do, again, type them in. So in this part of the webinar, we really focused in on the quality of individual survey items down here in red. And in, in providing those res response options, in addition to making sure they, the responses match up with the question really well, you want to make sure your options are non-overlapping and exhaustive. 
it's really important to be aware of all these guidelines, and there's lots more for writing good survey questions, and try to follow them, as well as avoiding these common pitfalls. But it's still hard to get outside of our own heads and our own perspectives. So my last bit of advice here is to always do a review. Of course, you're self-reviewing, but if you can engage colleagues as well, um, review your questions, and, and also pilot test them with the people that are actually going to respond. Because it, I've, I've never had a situation where I've written a, a survey perfectly the first time. You have other people look at it, it always reveals issues. So I'm going to turn it over to Kristen now for questions. Sorry, Lori, I was um, very busy trying to, to um, look at some of the other problems with the um, example that you gave us. But we do have some questions that we do want to address. Um, let's see, how would you word a survey question to get at the quality of a workshop given to a small group? Because you, um, you were not, you're showing how it shouldn't be. Well, I think you could definitely ask about quality, but if it has, I, you know what I might do is separate um, closed-ended and open-ended items into two different forms, actually, if they're doing it in person, because um, that way you're taking away the rating qualities with the, the more unique individualistic responses in the open-ended items. Um, if you're doing it electronically, there may not be a workaround. You might want to just... Um, have conversations with people. I mean, there's other ways of getting at people's perceptions. And if you do have a very small work group, then a survey may not be um, the way to do it anyway. So it's just to be kind of aware. And again, I think the, the thing, when you have an anonymous survey, the risk of it actually not being anonymous is in when people have an opportunity to provide additional feedback, because sometimes it's really easy to identify people based on the opinions that they express. Great. We do have a couple comments I just want to um, read off, and you can comment back if you wish. Uh, Robin is saying that regarding the surveys that others are using earlier in the, um, in the first segment, she says to look at the CURE survey, C-U-R-E, and that stands for Classroom Undergraduate Research Experience. So if anyone's interested in that, just look at the top um, end of the chat and you'll see uh, what Robin is suggesting. And then Laura Smith is telling you you've got great slides and she loves the bubbles, Lori. Thank you, Laura. So good Thank visuals. <laughs> um, Karen is wondering how you would address the issue of quality, a workshop quality in a small group. Oh, wait, we've got two of those. I'm sorry. Uh, Laura is saying this in the scale example, you have four options. What is the ideal number of options on a scale? That's a great question. I see Barbara's question there. Hello, Barbara. Barbara's on our National Visiting Committee, so thanks for being here. Barbara has a similar question I see there at the very bottom. Is it best to offer an even or odd? And we're actually going to talk about that in the next segment, so I won't take time to answer it right now. Okay. And Karen is wondering, is it important to keep the response options consistent throughout the survey? That's a really good question because sometimes, I mean, that's why I tend gravitated toward the agreement scale because it's really easy to make questions that kind of fit that sort of. Um, and there's trade-offs there because I like to be consistent in the measures. It makes it easier for analysis and reporting. It makes it easier for survey design. But there can really be some trade-offs when you try to um, um, make everything fit a certain a certain format. We just experienced this with actually with questions we're trying to create for the ATE survey of grantees. Um, where we had a set of questions about business and industry involvement in, in, pro in developing programs and curriculum and, and, and being involved in um, curricular programs. And we struggled and struggled and struggled and tried to how to get the right response options that match the question. And we finally realized we had a group of questions that were talking about how how integral these business and industry partners with, were with program delivery and then how influential they were in designing a program. And so when we finally saw that difference that we could pull those apart, we created separate response options for them. So if it can work out, great, but don't ever try to force a question to match a certain response option just for, for the sake of having it be nice and clean like that. OK, great. Um, the rest of the questions, they appear to be about your um, possible other question as we're into the next section. So Lori, I'm going to move us on forward. Okay. Implications. 
Thank you for the good question. So we've talked about the importance of aligning survey data with your evaluation questions and talked about some common pitfalls when developing items. Another thing you need to do before actually doing your survey is to think ahead, before finalizing your questions, is to think ahead to analysis. And I think most people probably have a general sense of how they're going to analyze their data once it's in. But I think it's easy not to go far enough in this regard. It's hard to get questions just right. That's a big job in and of itself. And you're usually under some kind of pressure and deadline to get a survey out. So it's not hard to see why people will bypass the step of thinking ahead to analysis. There's a lot of issues you need to consider when it comes to analysis. I'm only going to focus on four. And I hope we have time to cover these four. Um, we're going to discuss some check issues with analyzing check all that apply responses, um, go over a common mistake when dealing with ordinal data, um, we'll address some of the questions people had about even versus odd numbered response option, and we'll also present an alternative um, to the traditional pre-post survey. So here is that question we worked on a few minutes ago. Um, by making it a check all that apply question, we handled the problem of those overlapping categories. Now, in many cases, this can be a reasonable solution. But if the intent was for us to be able to describe the composition of our audience and figure out how to tailor our content to our audience needs, this is probably not the best way to ask this question. So this is the place where, Kristen, if you could if anybody identified anything that was bugging them about this question, I'd like to hear that now. Sure. Um, we heard from Lara that also more than one role for lots of people. Diana said that staff could apply to all categories. Uh, Peggy was wondering about program versus project and the issues that may be in that. Uh, Allison, I would suggest providing a textbook, a text box next, next to the other category. And Frederica said, select the most salient role. Uh, Sheila said that sometimes people's titles don't necessarily reflect the work that they do. And they may work in one cat category, but have a title in another. Mm -hmm. Those are all outstanding observations. And I agree with all of them. So people touched on, the, the again, the issue of the overlapping categories. Um, again, and, and something we can, the, the simple, the nuance between a project and a program um, that's a, a big a big one that Peggy pointed out. Um, Laura pointed out the fact that there's so many categories people could put themselves into. Um, so yeah, those are all great. And here's another one. So this was a check all that apply. And um, let's say we had 100 people actually respond the, the whole survey. But we had 71 people select at least one box of these. Um, so we actually have 85 responses from 71 people. So the first problem is, is that um, we don't know about those other 29. Did they have no role in ATE or did they skip the question entirely? We probably should have had a none of the above box here, but we just missed that in the in this question development. And that, that's not the only problem. This is what it looks like when we put it on a graph. I always like to do some nice bar charts. Um, it's hard to get a sense, in my mind, what the composi composition of this group is, really. Um, and, the, and the person who pointed out adding the most salient role, the main role, that, that would have gone a long way to fixing this issue. Um, so these percentages, because people could check more than one box, the percentages actually add up to 120%. There's nothing technically wrong with this. It just makes it hard to describe who we're reaching. It's When you're reporting this, it's very annoying to have percentages that add up to more than 100%. And it's easy to overlook these implications for analysis when you decide to put a question in the check all that apply format. I know I've done it. Um, the point is you just want to think about what you need to know and how you're going to use the information. So think about how it may affect the way your results look. So here's the way we actually ask this question. Um, it's not perfect, but this is what we've settled on. Um, what is your main role within the ATE program? Peggy's point is good. People might not aff affiliate themselves at the program level. They may think of themselves at the project level. So that's, that's one thing I didn't even think of. Um, but here's the example of the results. We have 100 people, again, responding to the survey. Um, and we added that no ATE role. And we have other project staff. So and we can make a nice chart here that adds up to 
Now we give up some details, like we don't know all the different ways people are involved with the program, but it gives us some solid grounding from which to interpret results, and we can begin to, you know, look at okay, who are these folks with no ATE role? Why are they coming? What can we learn about them? Um, we weren't expecting all these other project staff people to come. Who are they? And maybe pick out, take some extra steps to learn who they are and what they need. And we can just report this. That we have this group, and we can report some nice, you know, proportions of who makes up our audience. And I don't want to leave you with the impression that check all apply questions are bad. That's not my point at all. It really depends on your purpose. And here's a nice example of a check all item that may tech shared with us. And they use this item to capture um, webinar impact, and it's really working really well for them. So I think check all that apply can be difficult if you're trying to describe the composition of a group. But uh, to get at like the different kinds of impacts you're having with different people, this can work really well. So now I want to move on to dealing with ordinal data. Um, OK, I want you to look around your desk and just put in the chat box how tall is the stack of papers on your desk. And yes, I know I'm making assumptions here that you have a desk, that you have papers on it, and that you only ha if you do have papers on it, you only have one stack. But how many inches is it? One, oh, so he's got a really nice short one. Two, we see nine, okay, great. Easy to measure, right? Well, Kristen and I measured ours yesterday. <coughs> Mine is six inches, and Kristen's was one inch. She's obviously more organized than I am. And we know that my stack is six times the height of Kristen's, and that the average of our two stacks is 3.5 in inches. This really isn't debatable. Um, this is an example of ratio data. It's, it's, uh, the key thing is that the distance between the points on the scale, and the scale here is inches, are the same. This is not the case for ordinal data. It's not clear with ordinal data the distance between the points, because it depends on the, how the individual interprets the scale. It's idiosyncratic. Um, examples of ordinal data include uh, frequency, like this, agreement, like this, or quality. There are lots of other kinds. Um, all Likert scales are ordinal, and it's, these are used, these are just ubiquitous in social research and evaluation. Here's an ex even in health, because I'm going to show an example that actually comes from health. I really like this one. This is a pain scale, and I actually use this with my kids. It's um, just a smiley face part. It's for people to communicate their level of pain or discomfort. This version actually presents the scale in three ways. We have the smiley faces, we have numbers, and we have the descriptors. And it's easy to be deceived into thinking, because they're present, the numbers are presented here, that if we just choose to use the numbers, that it's no longer ordinal. Um, but that's actually not the case, because my 7 here may not be the same as your 7. And the distance between my 6 and my 8 may not be the same between my 8 and my 10. I will try to explain this a little further. Let's say this guy here is for me a really bad headache. And this guy here at the 8 level is the flu. And here at the extreme end is childbirth. Now for me, a 6 and an 8 are much closer together than the 8 and the 10. The point is the scale doesn't have equal distances. And we may look like it does. We may want it to. But the, it doesn't. So the results can't be averaged into a mean. People will do this all the time, but it's technically wrong. When it comes to research and evaluation, Again, you see this all the time. It's just not appropriate. Um, remember, let's say, let's think about that stack of papers again. But now we're going to say um, the pain scale. Kristen's at a 1, and I'm at a 6. So can we say, like with the paper example, that I am 6 times less comfortable than Kristen? Or that my pain is 6 times greater? Or that the average between us is a 3.5 on the scale? Of course we can't. This seems obvious when we look at it this way, but yet it, it's just so common to see people doing this because it, it's a convenient way to analyze data. Oh, I forgot to put that up. Yes, we treat it, we're treating ordinal as if it were continuous or ratio data, as if we're using something as consistent as a measuring tape. 
so let's take this question as example, the quality of this webinar. What's commonly done, in spite of all the events, event, advice to the contrary, is that you assign a point to uh, each point on the scale. You assign a numerical value to each place on the ordinal scale, and a mean rating is calculated. But what does a 2.55 mean? If you saw this in a report, what, what would you think the quality of the webinar was? If you needed to use the information to figure out where improvements are needed, or if something should be continued or not, how would you interpret this? Is it an accurate representation of respondents' opinions? So this same, using the same data that I used to calculate this mean, if we do a distribution, we get this. Now in my mind, this is much more meaningful. Um, as a 2.5, when I see 2.55, I think that's not so great. Right? It's somewhere between a fair and a good if we make the assumption that we can average. It's not great. That is not what I hope for people to perceive our webinars as. Um, but if we look at the distribution here, um, we see that some people, and this is made up data by the way, um, we see a big group of people perceiving it as poor and a big group of people perceiving it as excellent. To me, to me this doesn't, doesn't, it means that a 2.55 is not really an accurate picture of the perceptions of the webinar. We're making some people really happy and other people's really, really unhappy. And we can sit down and think about what this really means and why these results are happening. And one possibility that occurs to me is that the people giving it a poor rating was not even the intended audience. They shouldn't have been there in the first place. It's possible. It's not necessarily why. Or they had a different level of knowledge. But at least we can you know, then we can look at the qualitative comments and we can try to pick this apart instead of just putting a single number on it and say, this is, this is how good your webinars are. Okay, now we're going to get to this issue of even versus odd that people brought up. Um, this is actually an issue people like to debate about whether you should have even versus odd. And there's honestly no one right answer. And this is a topic that we actually had Michael Quinn Patton um, the guru of utilization-focused evaluation talk about on our newsletter that just came out today. Um, a even-numbered scale forces respondents to choose. It forces them to take to, to express an opinion either favorably or unfavorably. Um, I my this is my preference for most of the work that we do to find out a, to get people's opinions about our work because I really want to know what side of the fence they're on. It's not necessarily always the right way to go about it. Um, other people will argue for a middle category sometimes with an agreement scale. It sometimes looks like this, a neither agree nor disagree, and this allows respondents to be neutral. But it's still on the scale, the ordinal scale of opinion. A different way to go about this is to leave it as a four-point scale, but allow respondents to indicate that they don't have an opinion formulated about this. And this is subtly different um, than, than putting the middle category in. So again, there's no right answer. You just need to think it through and make an informed decision based on what you need to know and how you're going to use the information. And finally, I want to touch on um, the issue of pre-post surveys. And this is something people like to use to measure impact. And I know we're running short on time because we got a late start, but I wanted you to leave on time. So I'll run through this fairly quickly. Let's say we have a five-week professional development program and we want to measure impact on knowledge, or at least the per participants' perceptions of their learning. The traditional pre-test, post-test model is to conduct a, um, a pre-test at the beginning of the program and a post-test at the end of the program. And then you would compare the differences. Um, the problem is in the interim of those several weeks, the respondent's frame of reference may have shifted and quite likely did shift. Now pre-post surveys are, gr or pre-post tests are great for measuring knowledge change, but if you're using self, doing a self-assessment, um, it may not be the best way to go. So the, the difference with um, an alternative is called a retrospective pre-post, where you actually move the pre-test to the time of the post-test, and people do the before and after ratings at the same time. I'll give you a quick example. Let's say we have a workshop on evaluation design and, and we have a researcher who's come to me, coming to it and she thinks she's got a great understanding of the topic so she gives herself a rating of excellent. But she may have been equating evaluation design with survey design or questions or, or whatever it is. It's a common mistake that we see um, 
we discussed at the beginning of the webinar. So then she gets she goes to the workshop, and then at the post test, she realized she actually overrated herself. But the pretest is long gone, and there's nothing she can do about it. Um, she, but now she believes she's developed a strong knowledge of evaluation design because of the workshop, so she gives herself an excellent rating again. But from the analyst perspective, it looks like no improvement. In fact, it looks like she shouldn't even have been in the workshop because she started off with such a high level of knowledge. Alternatively, the retrospective pre-post format, um, the respondent answers the before and after questions, as I said, at the end of the program at the same time when they have the same frame of reference. And here we see the respondent was able to give more accurate self-assessment of her levels of knowledge, and um, we actually see a big improvement, at least in her perceived impact of the workshop. So the takeaway is do plan ahead for how data will be analyzed and think about it in the big picture. And I will turn it over to Kristen so we have time for some final questions. Great. Oh, yeah. Oh. I, I'm sorry. One more thing I just want to mention. Interpretation and synthesis is what we'll be talking about in our March webinar. We'll go into that in much more detail. So. Sorry. Thank you, Lori. So um, Shelly has a question going back to your example of the ATE categories. And she's wondering, is a grant writer appropriate? Don't agencies write the grant and individuals the proposals? Say the question again. She's asking, is grant, write, grant writer appropriate as a category because don't agencies write the grant and individuals the proposals? I'm not sure I understand. See, again, this is a great example. I, I don't really understand the question. We're using terms that people use a lot. Um, I know a lot, a grant writer, oh, a grant writer, yeah, propo a proposal. I see what she's saying, talking about writing the application versus the, the actual RFP. Yeah, there could be lots of problems in there. That isn't actually the categories that we use. But that is a term that people will use to describe themselves, and we have another category. OK. Um, Sheila wants to know, how exactly does a no opinion option differ from a neutral op option? What are the implications for analysis? Well, that's what you need to think through in the context of your own work, right? Like, I, especially in an agreement scale, I don't like the middle category. How can you neither agree or not agree? You must just not care. Um, so I don't like that. Now, you might have a middle category. I'm trying to think of one. Um, on a, let's say, a, a poor to excellent, you might have a middle category. Um, so that's more obvious. Like if you had a poor to ex excellent scale and you had a middle category, then that's very, very different than having a no opinion. But I do think sometimes use, people use a middle category to just say, well, I don't really, I don't know, I don't really thought about this, I don't really care, and they use a middle category. So it's just thinking about the nuances of this and how you need to be able to interpret and use the information. I, there's no one right way to do that. I just want to bring it up to, to people's you know, awareness to think it through. Um, Kathy is going back to Shelley's question about the grant writer category, and she's noting that um, agencies write the RFPs of she, what she thought Shelley was speaking about. And Linda Scott was saying, no, not at all. Many PIs write their own proposals. So I think there's still um, there's more confusion amongst others as well. You aren't alone, Lori. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just goes to show the importance of getting clarity on these terms. I mean, it's, yeah. it's really hard. And it's difficult to do in a chat box as well. I've yeah. been on the other side of this too. So Amy is wondering that she noticed you put excellent on the left and poor on the right. What are your thoughts about putting these labels in increasing or decreasing order? And she says that they tend to use increasing. Yes, and that's the way I, I don't know, I can't remember which slide that was. But in our surveys, we always do it. Um, from poor to excellent, that actually best practice and the advice in the field is to actually mix up the order of your scales. And I don't do that because I know how people respond, like, do actually fill out surveys. Like, if they had, you know, they just had an overall feeling about the thing and they want to give all high marks, they'll just go down and mark um, all in the, in the one column um, without really reading them carefully. So even though that's what's advised, I don't know actually do it. But I do agree. When I set them up, I make it from a, a smaller to an increasing amount. So if I didn't show it on that slide, that's I apologize. Okay, Robin has a thought uh, or question. 
Um, our problem with pre-post, some sort of problem we face is that two groups of students rating ability with lab notebook. One group of students gets a lab notebook self-assessment that reveals problems with notebook, these students doing undergraduate research. The other batch of students not doing undergraduate doing only cookbook labs. They think they're awesome at doing lab notebooks. So I think she's, um, you know. Well, I think that's a you go ahead. I think that's a great, I think that's a really informative finding because you, you don't want to look at that like that, that could be, you could look at that and say that's contradictory, but they're actually tapping into different uses of it. And I think that could be a really informative finding for your evaluation. Okay, Peggy really likes the example of the lab notebook as well. We've got quite a few questions here. Um, we have uh, just three minutes though, Lori. I'm wondering if we want to hold off on some of these questions until the very end. Would you agree? Yeah, why don't we go ahead and do our, our next business. We did get a late start, but I think we still have to end okay. on time. Okay, good. Um, I mean, our next day, I didn't mean questions. I meant, and, and then uh, we'll try to hit some of these questions at the end if we have time. But I'm just going to um, remind you that in March, we have a webinar. And in that webinar, we'll share strategies for moving beyond description to real evaluation that's systematic. And we'll also show you how to present these results in efficient and compelling ways. So join us in March. And our website is there to look under events. Um, we also, on our website, you can find that it's a great vehicle to learn more about ATE evaluation. The website contains a digital resource library where you can download issues of our um, newsletter and recordings of our past webinars. So make sure you visit it. And some of the people that earlier had questions about finding um, different books and authors, you can go to this uh, spot to find them. Since we're really um, out of time right now, we're going to go ahead and thank you for joining us today. If you're finishing up the survey, um, that, you know, we'll keep it up for you for a while. And on behalf of all of us here at Evaluate and our friends at Maytech, thank you for joining us. And we want you to have a really great day. Thank you.